11, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined today by Keith Watson and Mike Hill. Um, and Keith has the first article for this week. So an interesting article um, was actually uh, came out earlier and it was related to a problem with Google's two-factor authentication and we have recommended Google's two-factor authentication several times in the podcast and um, so I thought this was important to talk about uh, we're certainly not recommending you switch away from it but this is one where a flaw was found and reported and a correction has already been made so hopefully no one was out there exploiting this issue uh, but it's good to be aware of this problem. So the problem is basically tied to the fact that when you are interacting with the Google website and you enter your two-factor authentication, you use a tool to generate that one-time password. And that password changes every 30 seconds. If you're using an application uh, to talk to some Google service, so you might have a, a chat application or you might, have, uh, you might use Gmail uh, through IMAP, uh, those you can't enter a password uh, using the one-time password system. They have to have what's called an application-specific password. Now, those passwords are generated through the two-step verification tool, and it allows you to generate dynamically a password, which, it gen which Google will generate for you, and then you can just cut and paste that password into whatever application you're using, and then you can name it. So you might say, well, I want to act, I want to use this application-specific password for uh, Google Chat, and you might create another one for your IMAP system to talk to Gmail, for example. The problem is that these passwords have complete access to your Google account. So regardless of what you name them for and how you use them, just having access to the application specific password gives you access to the entire account. And so somebody who's captured your application specific password for uh, IMAP would still be able to use that password to gain access to anything on your on your account. Uh, and so this was reported by a group known as Duo Security and they actually make one-time password solutions and they have integrated into a variety of stuff and they have a, uh, several products which are very interesting tied to VPNs and uh, Unix SSH tools, the web um, and using Microsoft tools as well. And so they're building tools that run on two-step verification type systems and so in the process of uh, building their product they probably came across this issue with Google and reported it. Now thankfully Google has already uh, made a correction to the verification system. However, it's not a complete solution. Um, the passwords are still have complete access to the account. That part's not changed. Um, so there's not a way to designate a specific application password for a specific Google service, for example. That would be ideal. Um, these uh, corrections are more of about uh, labeling it when you create an application specific password it actually tells you that password has complete access to the system and then they made another change to an underlying uh, problem in the in Google's infrastructure to kind of reduce the likelihood that this uh, stolen application specific password for a Google account um, would be able to um, bypass the two-step verification system now it's not a foolproof solution, but they have made a few changes to strengthen their their uh, system, and some of that is related to kind of the OAuth tokens used under the hood to do the the authentication. Now on on the Duo Security blog, there's a very very detailed list of of how this uh, attack works and Google's fix for it. Um, and it talks about really the risks associated with this and then provides a couple updates. So I found it very interesting. Um, one, because this is a good example of a responsible notification. There was a problem, they went to Google, they reported it, Google corrected it, and then they provided complete details of how they found it, why it was an issue, and what the fix was, and just various updates about, uh, about it once it had been corrected. So. I thought this was good. Obviously, this is a good way to advertise your business, which I think 
is one one thing they're doing, but they're also helping the community out as well. So I, I found that to be uh, a very interesting post. Well, I have a, a comment mainly about application specific passwords and how they kind of work. Um, if you use the Google uh, one time or uh, yeah one time password system and you create an application specific password, you see that password once and you put it in your application and you never ever see it again. You you will you don't know what you basically don't know what it is um, anymore unless you can pull it out of your application. So from Google's perspective, um, really they should only see the same thing using this password all the time. They should never see this password being used by other applications maybe uh, down the line. So it seems to me like um, they would have a pretty good good uh, method of detecting this password being used in malicious ways because um, you basically have a it's, it's essentially generated you see it you put it in your application you never see it again and 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 that's I think how it was designed uh, to be so that you you couldn't uh, use this in all your applications but the the I think the flaw is that the, again, it gives administrative access to your entire Google account, and I think Google knows that these are not as secure as a one-time password. They're one, they're two-factor authentication one-time password system because it's just a password, and I don't think they, I don't think necessarily all their services are forced over a secure channel either. So this password can be potentially. Um, seen over the line, um, which is also a potential problem. That's true. I think uh, for the most part, a good chunk of Google services now all use HTTPS. Um, now, there could be some clients, third-party clients, that don't. But for the most part, most of the Google services in which you're authenticated, those occur over HTTPS. So that while that is always a possibility with some applications, I think it's less likely using Google's services itself. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But it, the, also, the the password does have to be stored on a device or a medium Absolutely. or whatever, and that's not Absolutely. necessarily stored securely. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I'm just... Um... The thing I'm surprised by is that that password would get you into everything within Google um, using the application-specific passwords. That that part's the alarming part to me. Um, it, it doesn't surprise me that it'd work across multiple devices uh, because I've used the system myself. I, I've not done that, but I could see where you could. You could capture that application-specific password and tie it to multiple applications, uh, multiple devices you're using. But uh, what I'm surprised to read about in this article was the fact that I could turn around and use that to get into my administrative side of my Google account. And essentially, I could turn off two-factor authentication. I could change my password. I could completely uh, redo my account using using that particular password. That, that, to me, seems to be the flaw. You shouldn't be able to go that far with it. It should be contained. Um, so that if you went to do those additional things and say, oh, well, you have two-factor enabled, you now need to enter a code. Right, yeah. The problem is with, with these applications that are not set up to handle uh, one-time password systems, you've got to have a fallback. And unfortunately, that's the, applic that's the application-specific password. And the fact that it has complete access to your account is kind of a problem. It would be better if you, when you generated a one-time or a uh, application-specific password, you could designate what service it was for. That would be ideal, but it doesn't do that today. Yeah, I, I think it might be something that is hap going to happen down the line, but I think that's just one of those changes that isn't something they can make in a day. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> that's a more significant infrastructure change. No, and I think that was the original intent. When you use it, you kind of get the idea that that's how they intended for it to work ultimately, but they probably still need to put some additional things into the software to support it. But, uh, you know, it is quite application specific, and when you create it, you know, the instructions are, you know, create this and uh, put it in your application and, and forget it. You don't ever need to use it again. You know, you've authorized this particular application on this device using uh, this one, this password. Yep. 
Well, that's all I had to say about that. Um, I thought it was an interesting issue. Um, certainly affects a tool that we've recommended. Um, and it's good to see that there have been some corrections made, uh, but there's still an issue out there. So, you know, the risk is there. It's a little lower today, at, li at least. Okay. Uh, well, I've got the second article for today. And uh, last week was the uh, Pwn to Own uh, 2013. And uh, we talked about this on a similar podcast a year ago. Um, and uh, this was taking place at Cansec West. And um, over the course of two to three the two days, um, Java was pwned uh, four times. Uh, probably not too surprising to our audience that, that Java was taken down like that. Um, other major brow uh, some major browsers, including IE10, uh, Chrome, and Firefox, were also pwned. Um, Opera was not a browser option, and uh, Safari. Uh, no one, uh, interestingly, no one attempted to hack. Um, Safari, and there wasn't really any good indication as to why. So uh, um, I, I don't know that we would say Safari is more secure than those browsers. It, it just didn't seem to stir up the interest. Um, other uh, vulnerabilities were found in, in Flash and Adobe Reader. Uh, so what they did this year is uh, typically um, they they only award the money uh, for the first person that uh, the breaks that, that performs the hack successfully um, but in this case this year they actually awarded the money um, for every instance so uh, the result of that was a payout of nearly five hundred thousand uh, dollars was paid out uh, for these vulnerabilities um, additionally um, uh, last year in Pwn to Own uh, Google had actually pulled out because of the way uh, it was conducted last year where the vulnerabilities didn't have to be disclosed uh, so they held their own Ponium, uh, which we talked about on that previous podcast. Uh, they did Google did participate in Pwn Own this year, but they also still held a separate Ponium competition. Uh, and the award for uh, breaking Chrome OS in this case would have been Pi million dollars, so 3.14 million dollars uh, would have been paid out. Uh, however, uh, no one was able to successfully um, crack into that. So. Um, so I think some good things came out of that, and um, I was just seeing that uh, Firefox and Chrome have already patched uh, their browsers as a result of the Pwn to Own competition. So um, IE10 uh, still has not been patched, so I assume it'll probably be in one of the uh, Patch Tuesday rollouts, so they may do something a, a little sooner than that. Um, but overall, uh, I've, I've seen some mixed opinions on whether this is a, a good thing or not to, to pay for these vulnerabilities. And, and I'm of the opinion that I think this is, is really good. Uh, it's a good venue for, um, you know, this is not much money for any of these uh, vendors to pay out uh, to, to find these vulnerabilities. And, um, and they're able to get them patched and, and update the software versus some of these being released in the wild and, and taking longer to find. So what do you guys think about this? Well, uh, <clears throat> from my understanding is these, these issues that are uh, found in this contest are not publicly disclosed. They're disclosed to the vendors and then they're paid the money and the vendor has the opportunity to fix them before they go out into the wild. Um, so I think that's a good thing that they're not publicly disclosed until they're fixed. Um, the other thing I was going to say is Java's gotten a pretty bad rap lately and probably rightfully so. Um, just tons of vulnerabilities have been come out, coming out on Java and I think uh, Java's days are are numbered now. I mean, it, I think any new developer that starts developing applications would be insane to start creating anything on Java just because of, 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 its, of its bad press. And I don't even know how many open vulnerable zero days there are still out on Java that have not been fixed. But it's it's pretty it's 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 pretty bad lately for Java. Well, it's bad for Java in the terms of web app development, or I should say in terms of web, the client side, uh, Java. Um, Java is still, I believe, the number two most popular programming language, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. What will change probably is having Java applets 
run in your browser. All right, I I totally agree with that. That's okay. that's what I'm referring to. Web okay, applications. Well, I'm just checking, <laughs> just checking, because I it's not going away, but but I think how it's used is. It's just like we see uh, less Flash development today. We see we've seen a lot less Java applet development. In fact, I only know you know one thing that I have to use that is a Java applet, uh, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we're seeing more, you know, server side related stuff. We're seeing more HTML5 related stuff. So, but when we talk about HTML5, then there's a whole bunch of risks and vulnerability potentials there. That's new technology, new protocols, and new implementations to support that in all these browsers too. And a lot of I think these vulnerabilities could be related to poor implementations of CSS3 and HTML5 too as well as JavaScript interpreters. So there's still a lot to uh, be afraid of, but you're right. I think Java is kind of diminishing in terms of its importance as well as Flash maybe. We'll see. But I, to go I, back I, to some of the other some of the other discussion points, um, the, the amount of prizes is interesting and um, and the number of, of successful exploits found, I think, is also very interesting as well. You were going to say something. Go ahead. I was just going to say I wouldn't be surprised when a day comes when uh, you install Java and it's not enabled on your web browser by default. Um, as just a matter of them changing the way they, they do things. It's, it won't be relevant as a web browser plug-in for forever. Right. Absolutely. Um, it was interesting that uh, both Firefox and Chrome uh, updated prior to the contest. And Firefox went to uh, 19.02, and Chrome had its usually long uh, version number updated as well. So I wonder if those were to uh, catch some last second uh, <clears throat> vulnerabilities before the contest to kind of reduce the likelihood of somebody breaking it. Or or what? And it's very interesting. Yeah, I, I think that was probably definitely the reason, <laughs> especially in Chrome's case. Uh, with that much money on, on the table, um, you know, I wonder if someone had a successful attack in mind and uh, that, that patch just a couple of days before might have uh, broke it for them, <laughs> their, uh, their chance to get a payout maybe. So, um, you, you know, another thing I found interesting, uh, and I don't know if this is just the way the contest is designed, uh, but it looks like most of these exploits were also running uh, on Windows. Um, and i am got several articles open here, and I believe that really the only one that maybe could have been executed on Mac would have been the Apple Safari. Um, even though, you know, Chrome and Firefox can run on, on Mac, I think they were broken on Windows 7. And, and I don't know if that's just the way the contest is set up or not. Uh, but, but I find that kind of interesting that, um, that the attacks that were completed successfully were, were on Windows. I don't know if that's just because it's always been the bigger target and, and that's what people are more familiar with. Um, I'm not suggesting necessarily that the Mac is uh, more secure. I just I find it interesting that uh, no one really went after it. To me, that would have been the... Uh, the advantage of maybe going after Safari is to say, oh yeah, well it's vulnerable on Max as well because look, Safari's got this got this bug in it. Well, I think another thing that's interesting um, is the their definition of what is considered what's a, a payout, uh, what what kind of vulnerability requ is required for a payout, and these are not trivial vulnerabilities. Uh, their their definition is you have to have a vulnerability that requires little to no uh, action by the user in order to exploit. So these would be drive-by downloads. You visit a website and you get exploited. This, this can't involve just them having to click a, you know, go do things or open attachments or, or whatever in the browser. This requires uh, little to no, maybe uh, clicking a link I think is okay, but anything I think more than that would not be considered a, a, a get, not be considered a payout by the contest rules. Another interesting one that, that did not have any winner was the Google Chrome OS. And uh, for those that may not be familiar, familiar uh, Google makes uh, uh, software to run on very specific hardware called Chromebooks 
and if you've ever used one it's like using a Chrome browser and that's the entire operating system at least that's the front end of it the part you see and that one had um, uh, no winning entry but they have one that they're looking at that may get partial credit now it could be that nobody bothered with it there's always that um, it could be it's actually pretty good I don't know what's interesting with the chromium OS uh, which is the basis of Chromebooks is that it does have a very sophisticated security model and it tie and it is tied to some of the hardware as well so it's designed uh, to be used in a, uh, a hostile environment so maybe maybe it's actually uh, pretty secure I don't know so uh, just to clarify is Chrome OS does Chrome OS not run Chrome? Is it running a different, uh, essentially, web browser? So a break in Chrome OS is a break in Chrome. A vulnerability in Chrome is not necessarily a vulnerability in Chrome OS. I believe they are very similar in terms of the web browser side of it. However, there's some more, you know, hardware and and system management features that Chrome OS would have that Chrome uh, that Chrome does not have. Uh, but that's a good question. I don't know how closely they're linked. So if one had a vulnerability, if it would be likely that the other one did too, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, and we'll then we'll wrap it up. Uh, thanks to Mike Hill and Keith Watson. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.